So Jean, Jean Sperling, um, my friend, my colleague, and many time boss. Um, I think a lot of you know him. He um, has, ser has served twice in a White House role, both times as the director of the National Economic Council. Um, pretty extraordinary because having lived through a, one White House and one first administration, then coming back for the second one, um, very different environments, booming economy, recovery economy. Um, Gene always, 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 always was deeply passionate about um, numbers, about data, about evidence, about results. Um, but he did it with a view toward who are the people behind that. Um, never forgetting the children, never forgetting the working families. Um, always the biggest advocate in every policy fight um, for um, what are we doing about those who are least vulnerable, most vulnerable, most vulnerable, and um, are you know, most in need of some of the things that we've been working on and some of the programs we've been talking about. Um, Melody Barnes, who was my boss when I was at the White House, constantly talked about Jean as her biggest ally. She always knew that Jean was gonna be on, often be on the side of um, the same side she was on. So luckily, um, he was there while she was there. Um, we um, uh, have lost Jean to the West Coast. Um, he commuted between DC and LA for nine months. Um, every weekend going back to see his two children, um, supporting his dear wife, his wonderful wife, his talented wife, who is now writing a Netflix series. So we'll all soon be addicted to that. Um, she um, is uh, starting, she started about a, a year ago or so. And so Gene did this commute, um, finally wore himself out and decided to move back about a, a, a month ago. So this is his first trip back to um, Washington, D.C., and I think maybe the first day that you're not going to walk your daughter to school. I think he's been every single day walking his daughter to school. So thank you, Gene, for coming back to Washington for us, and um, really appreciate your remarks today. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, uh, uh, Shiva. Good, happy birthday. And... Um, uh, now, M Michelle did kind of out herself as not really understanding the city of Los Angeles if she thinks you walk your daughter to work. Uh, but it is true that I have gotten to, every day I was in town, take her to school, pick her up, take her to her multiple afternoon activities, and, and it is a uh, joy. Uh, there are other joys I have, which is like when they mentioned the uh, free water b bottles, it was like the first time in so many years where I thought to myself, oh yeah, I'll just take a few. I don't have to worry about <laughs> the gift policies, the White House ethics, how much they cost. So that was, you know, that, that was pretty good. Um, now, Michelle, um, Michelle didn't mention uh, what kind of happened this morning, so basically, you know, normally when you leave, you, uh, you, you find a place where you're going to be a guest scholar, so you have an assistant and people can call. And I really wanted to just have this rare moment in my life where I was just completely, you know, off the grid, um, which means that while I have one or two people who occasionally will help me on research, when it comes to anything dealing with logistics, travel schedule, meetings, it's all me. So I'm a person who's been known for all these years as having very crazy schedules, intensely crazy schedules, and amazing assistants who somehow manage me. So Michelle is one of the friends who is just terrified of the idea that I am like on my own. Um, so I get this call this morning, and I know her cell phone, I see her number, and uh, I think to myself, I, I missed the call, but I saw it, and I thought to myself, there's really nothing for her to be calling about. We just spoke yesterday. We've been through absolutely everything. This is just the panic call. Um, so, and I could just see her thinking, you know, a lot of people get confused about April 30th. There's not an April 31st and all that. So, so I get the call. I get the call from Michelle, and it says, uh, and so um, she goes, uh, so I actually goes, Jean? Is everything okay? And I mean, with just perfect timing, if I don't say so myself, I just have this like long pause and I go, oh, is that today? <laughs> <laughs> and then I just, just let it hang for about three seconds 
in which I remember that we're over 50 now and I can't uh, play pranks like that on my friends anymore. Uh, so um, anyways, uh, so thank you for, um, thank you for having me, uh, for having me here. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, let me, um, let me uh, uh, try to um, give you a few opening thoughts uh, for the day. Uh, first of all, I just want to say I think this effort is great. I think it's great, and I think it's uh, just the type of effort I, I just feel very positive about for a lot of reasons, which is, one, um, it's been very action-oriented. I mean, the fact you got the scorecard, you have the letter, you're doing specific issues, you're not just out there in the abstract. You're using your knowledge of how people are in government to get their attention, to put the focus on. And I think that is extremely important. And I think building that kind of coalition is important. And I think building that type of ethic. Uh, I think that the more this happens, the more of us and the more younger people who go in and rise positions start just having this ethic. And that's when you'll have really uh, had success. And I think if I look at my 20 years, I've seen that build gradually. Uh, uh, as it's um, happened. And I think it's true uh, that, you know, there's more focus on this when times are, are tight, but I think it's more of a, almost a cultural and ethic uh, that people have. I also appreciate the bipartisanship, uh, and not just, you know, in your membership, but even in, in, the, um, uh, in the things that have been written. Um, you know, I, I note that when people are talking about the progress, you know, people have have noted that it's been a continuation. I think, as Mayor Castro said, you know, progress is people handing the torch. And I think some, you know, President Clinton started with the Government Performance and Results Act, and there was, you know, we certainly had that, that focus there, but I think the Bush administration came in with their part, uh, uh, their pro, you know, their program uh, uh, evaluation tool. And I think it was very nice of Ron Haskin, uh, who's been on the other side, to acknowledge that, that now that that you, you've never had administration more focused on data results uh, than the Obama administration. But I think that's a continuation of bipartisan effort. You saw even Ted Kennedy and Enzi, while Ted Kennedy was alive on Head Start, were doing these things. So I think what's been very good that's actually happened is that this hasn't been a who's better than each other. This has been a, a situation of continuation uh, of progress and having people like Chairman Nussel and, and Ron and myself and John Bridgeland and Melody all working together really sends an important message. Now, I um, uh, uh, do want to just say that I do think it is the case. There's no question. When times are scarce, you look a little harder. Sometimes you, you push a little more. You can make some more changes, reforms. You look outside the box. You look how you can use money better. You look how you can do things outside of government. But the truth is, whether times are flush or scarce, you should be looking for results. So that may give it a little push, but it should be there. And you know, one of the things that I say constantly to people is, we in Washington do get confused between the means and the end of our policy. Um, we often talk about the means to things as if it's the end goal, and it's not. No matter how much you want to fight about did spending go up in this area or did it go down or revenues went up in this area or revenues went down, uh, those start thinking, you start thinking that's the actual end goal, but they're not the end goal. Those are means to larger policy visions that you have. And to me, I think the three policy visions that dri should drive us and drive kind of the, what makes American economic policy, American values, is one, do you have an economy where you have a broad and inclusive middle class? I mean, that's the result. Any means you have is only measured by whether it helps lead to that goal. Secondly, are you having an economy where people can raise their family with dignity, work with dignity, retire with dignity? That's all what you measure against. And third, are we a nation in which the accident of your birth condemns your chances in life, or are we a place where everybody has a fair shot to rise? And so I think this is good because uh, it forces you to keep your eye on the prize, or in your terms here, your eye on the ball, um, uh, because it does force you to kind of ask, how many kids are we helping? 
it's not this program per se. The resources, whether you cut it or eliminate it, it keeps your eye on the ball. And we all know if we're here, you lose that focus all the time. So I think it's extremely important as a way of just keeping us all uh, uh, centered. Um, now, I will tell you that I think that uh, if you had complete sunshine and light and you could see every single thing that happened in the White House every meeting, I can't say all of it would be pretty. <laughs> but I think this would be pretty pretty. I think you'd be pretty happy. I think you would be pretty happy to see the degree that the President of the United States, and just as important, each other ask each other what evidence and proof do you have? Um, the, when we decided to do our initiative on early childhood, that was a meeting in the Roosevelt Room with the president where he said, things are tight. That doesn't mean I don't want to do big things. We already have health care. And he asked everybody to come with the view of what is the, he said, what is the most important thing we could do? And he said, that there is clear, hard evidence would work. And we went around the table and almost unanimously decided that a major commitment to quality early learning was the thing to do. So that major decision, the way the question was even asked, was the most important thing of which we had quality evidence. Um, I think that when I think of our focus on high school redesign, on the career academies, uh, when I look at what we're doing on work training, uh, we are being driven very, very much by what we know works, what the evidence shows. And again, I think that uh, uh, if you have a particular favorite issue, you're, and you're at a policy meeting and you don't have hard evidence, you're not dead, but you're under the gun. You, you feel an obligation to defend why you should keep trying on that program. And I think that is the way it is, should be. And I do think that that is just part of, of an increased kind of culture or ethic of the results, which I think you are uh, uh, you know, pushing. And I could go through some of the things that I think you have in the, your letter to Congress, which were good. I think the I-3, the uh, uh, investment in innovation, are good. But I'll talk about some of them maybe a little bit more uh, as just kind of general concepts that we could go forward on. Um, uh, let me give example of a couple of other areas where research and results was incredibly important not just in what works, but also just in identifying where even to look. Now, long-term unemployment is the greatest problem in our labor force today. Not unemployment, law enforcement unemployment. It is deep, it is scary. The impacts it has on people's health, opportunities are very devastating. Now, probably as a public policy response, we should be doing a lot more right now to get people to work, uh, and I'll just be honest in saying that kind of major initiative is unlikely to happen right now. But whether it happened or not, there were a couple of very important studies. People, some scholars in uh, Canada and University of Chicago, and then a separate study in MIT did basically the following. They sent out resumes that were identical, absolutely identical, except for one thing. The they would change one thing. They would change the person was unemployed for one month versus eight months, or one did from one month up to a year. One of the studies found that the exact same human being with the exact same work experience, everything the same, had to send out 15 times more resumes at 12 months unemployment as they did at one month unemployment. 15 times more. Now, what that kind of shows you is that even if you had all the money in the world, that if you don't do something about the, and I think it was unintentional largely, discrimination against people or stigmatization because they're long-term unemployed, those created a negative cycle, you weren't gonna totally solve this. So we went out and spent a year talking to the Fortune 500, the human resource folks, and started to find out. That was data-driven, and I will say in the meetings with the, um, CEOs, without that data that was so overwhelming, I don't think you would have been able to get their interest. Another area was that I focused on the end. We did a major college opportunity summit. Now, this is an area I'd worked a lot on, and I, you come back. And a lot of the issues are the same. But one thing that was very different was this issue of the undermatching. 
that there was a group of low income kids who actually were at the level to go to selective colleges. And the data, the evidence was just stunningly uh, disturbing. Basically, maybe 8% of low income kids actually had the kind of optimal uh, strategy. About 50% of high, sl low income selective kids didn't apply to one school uh, uh, that was at their level, not one. And these are the kids who've made it through. What was really good about this research that, that uh, Caroline Hoxby and Turner and Avery and, and ones by Castleman and, and Page and others that I'll mention, and I really admire, was they went the next step and they tried some things out. And they found out that, for example, if you actually sent a very customized package to one of those kids that said, hey, in your school, in your state, did you know these are the five best schools? You should go to one of these two schools. And here's a big one. Did you know that contrary to what everybody in your neighborhood and family might think, you might be able to go to the private school for free and pay less than you will by going to the community college down the block? Completely the opposite perception that people would have. And they found for this intervention of about $6 a kid, they moved the needle. Here's another one that was stunning to me, summer melt. Ben Castleman and them found that at big schools particularly, private schools, small schools are nice and care, take care of you. But let's say at the big schools, University of Michigan, University of Minnesota, University of Illinois, schools like that, selective good schools, a large number of low income kids got in and never enroll. And boy, do I understand, because, you know, my wife and I are, uh, are, are, are you know, pretty highly educated. Uh, uh, and man, if, our, if Occidental, where my son's going, didn't like call and say, uh, you know, you're supposed to get the dorm fee in last week, but that's okay, you know, feel free. Uh, you know, we did not make every uh, appointment. We were confused by things. And, you know, I mean, you know, look, as you could see why Michelle, you know, one thing I was teasing Michelle about was, uh, I said, well, Michelle, why do you have me here? You don't have any evidence that I'm going to be uh, particularly uh, good here. And so, you know, I thought, well, she's just, you know, for all of you who saw the movie Moneyball, there's that great scene where you have all the old scouts around the table, and they're all, like, given their, like, little folk wisdom of why you go for that player or not. So Michelle definitely did it under the folk wisdom that uh, a guy who marries a wife way cooler than, than he is uh, must have something going for him. Uh, so the um, – uh, but – they, but what would happen is for lower income kids, they would miss that dorm fee and then decide that they didn't think they had a place to live or they missed one deadline and they just never enrolled. So they called it summer melt. So these guys actually did a study where they just realized, well, there's one thing kids do, they text. So they just blizzard them with text messages. Three days from now is your dorm. Two days from now is your dorm. One day now is your dorm. They move the needle. It was, again, six, seven dollars. So that gives you, this was really, you know, I admire that type of research so much, the identification of the problem, and really, in this case, a rather low income input of what you could uh, do. So I think I'm going to come back to though, that though issue, though, to talk a little bit about um, uh, what I think are some of the challenges, and I'll use the college opportunity as some of the example. Um, I think that going forward, for me, uh, there's a few different things that I would make as my kind of challenge or us to be more effective in this. And in light of the real common practicalities that you face, and to be hard on ourselves, to legitimate issues that we need to deal with. So first of all, uh, one thing I feel very strongly about is we need to make sure in the world of testing and evaluation that we do not have a double standard against programs for low-income people. Um, you know, my sister's a scientist, NIH, et cetera. You know, you never hear anybody say, um, wow, they just funded a bunch of research on lung cancer, and it really didn't involve, well, forget about doing research on ending lung cancer. No, they take more the view, the FDR view, quote, it is common sense to take a method and try, and if it fails, admit it frankly and try another, but, uh, but of all, above all, try something. Now, on this low-income college issue, uh, 30 years ago, they found that if you were born in the lowest 
5% of kids, 5%, if you're born in the lowest 25%, will graduate from college. How is that for a horrible statistic in our country? And, but they found if you were in the top quarter, 36% would complete college. Then they did it 20 years later. And they found actually in the top 25%, good news, it went from 36% to 54%. So if you're born in the top 25%, you have better than a 50% chance, not just of going to college, but completing college. In the bottom 25%, over those 20 years, it went from five to 9%. So our great progress is now nine in 100 kids born into the bottom, uh, uh, into the bottom uh, 20, uh, 5% will complete college. I mean, that's a disgrace. That is a cancer on the society. That is, particularly when you know, the one thing that helps for inequality, et cetera, is when a kid from a low-income place completes college. Their chance of being, rising, become unbelievably better when they complete college. So here's the one thing we know that works, and it's terrible. So when I look at an issue like that, I think you have to look and say you're going to evaluate, et cetera, but you're not going to give up you're going to kind of keep trying. And that's what we would do in national security to protect us. That's what we should do uh, when you're trying to solve cancer. That's what we should do when we're trying to have that commitment. Um, and I think if people feel that you have that commitment, they will resist evaluation less because they don't think the entire mission is under assault. They think we're all trying to figure out how to do it better. Secondly and related, I think that when it comes to terminating programs, we need to have the courage to do so, but I also think we need to have a good dose of humility as well. There are times that you just know a program doesn't work. There's times everybody knows it, everybody would admit it. It's just constituency politics. Uh, it's been tried, and I do think you need to have the courage to terminate those programs. Uh, uh, probably better if you're reallocating the money to something that works. Uh, but on the other hand, I think we also have to be aware we need some bit of humility when we, when we do that as well. I mean, I like studies, but come on, let's be honest. There's times you see a study, and four years later, somebody else comes out with a different study that reverses those. If people think one single study is going to be the life or death of a program, that all you're doing is a one-study light switch on or off, they're going to resist. And often, I'm going to give you my little anecdote, which is pretty, pretty interesting, which is one of the things I did in the 90s I was very proud of was I was kind of the architect of the GIRA program. It reached low-income kids with college partnerships and tried to give them mentoring and encouragement to go to college. Well, as it got, went on, some people said, wow, that's a great way to improve learning in eighth, ninth grade, because if a whole classroom is going to be that way, then they're going to, uh, uh, then maybe, you know, they'll, they'll learn more. So some of the people started saying, well, let's test how well math scores are going up in eighth grade. Well, that's a great thing to do. But I started to panic a little and say, well, hold it. If that doesn't work, I mean, that's good to know. We should learn. But that wasn't the initial goal of the program. The goal of the program was you were going to inspire a group of kids to have middle class, high college expectations, and go to school. So, you know, I found myself on the situation of, of understanding, wow, if you've really worked hard on something and you think somebody's going to get it wrong and do one study and that's going to be the life or death of your program, you have a very different attitude towards it. And also, there is a tendency at times to kind of disparage people when a program hasn't worked. Oh, that person runs that program there and there's really no results. Well... You know, sometimes you're going to have sloppy, ineffective people who do not deserve to be running a program, and we should terminate it because it's not about them. It's about the kids. You're going, to other, you're going to have other cases where somebody's devoted their life for 20 years, and maybe they can't quite prove it, but they, could, they, they know there's 30 people out there going to college, having happy lives, got off drugs because of what they did, and they've sweat and blood for it. And if you just kind of come in and say, well, your life's basically been meaningless because like two 31-year-old kids, you know, at Amherst did a study and they didn't find a provable result, you're going to again get that resistance. 
So I think that that doesn't mean we don't terminate, but I think you have to have a dose of humility. I think, one, the people who you're studying have to have a chance to really participate and be heard. I think you don't want to use anecdotal things like the money ball, but on the other hand, qualitative assessment can help guide you a bit. If smart people go in and look at a program and say, you know, we're pretty sure this is changing lives. We don't know exactly. You know, if a program comes out and it says there is no difference at all, maybe you want to use that qualitative to cushion it or think about it. So I think you have to be courageous, but I do think you have to be uh, humble too. And this also comes to another issue too, which I think is the third issue is that where this leads me a lot is not that you don't have the courage to terminate, because I think you do need to pull the light switch sometimes. But I do think you will probably change the world a bit more by having the view of kind of a focus on evaluation, learning, and reform. So in other words, what I like about the I3 is we say we're going to invest in success. That's, I'm sorry, first thing. If you know things work, you should expand them. If you think things might be working, if qualitative judgment, smart people, gives you a sense they are, you may not want to expand them yet, but you may want to force them to evaluate. You may say, you looks good, but you know what? You can't quite establish how good you are right now. If you're that good, you should evaluate. Um, and third, I think learning what aspects of things work can lead to more reform. So let's say on our gear up proposal, so the gear up problem was the kids are all together in middle school, and then they go to different high schools. All right, so if it turns out the program doesn't work, do you kill it, or it's not working well enough, or do you say no, it turns out that what's really important is that 20 kids stay together. So now maybe what you say is in between continuation and termination, there's a little bit of a reform or die challenge. You know what, we think you're doing good things, a lot of this is working, but this aspect is not working. If you reform this, fine, we'll continue to give you the funds, but if not, then we're going to pull them away. But there you're learning that you can tell people that beyond continuation or reform, you can improve. Here's the aspect that works. In our training programs, I think most of them do not work. You know, some people say, well, let's just block grant them and put them together. But that doesn't tell you what works. What works is when they're employer driven, when they're demand driven. So we say, well, you know, we may not be able to agree on legislation, but we're running the federal government. Why don't we make sure every single training program starts with what are the skills needed in that area? How well do they test it? So I think that when you do those things, you give people a little more of a roadmap. And you may not have to rely on just passing legislation and having the termination or continuation fight, but maybe you, you can do the reforms. The other things mentioned, and I'll stop, which I think we are doing and I think are important, is these big, these big uh, formula programs. You don't even know how they're doing. The people just rely on them for funding. So I think this idea of trying to siphon off 10, 20 percent and say that's for innovation and then you tell the people, I know you're getting 10% less, but you can still compete for that. That's where I think we ought to be tough. It, we just can't afford to just give these big things and not work. So start with the evaluation. Then you can prove what works. Then you can start to crowd out what doesn't work. You give more and more to the things that are working. That, I think, is an easier way to move forward. And it's exciting in the administration because when you find something good, you think, well, maybe we can't change everything, but we got 100 million of this billion that we can, and we're going to work really hard on those things. So I think the innovation. I think when you have a competitive grant, a government, and you're in the administration, you should think that money is precious. Don't just let somewhere in the bureaucracy give it out. That should be like your test case to show success. And I think that's a time when times are flush, you don't pay attention to those. When times are scarce, you say, wow, we have $100 million that we can put out from the H-1B fee. Well, you know what? Let's do the high school redesign because that works, and we want to see if that works. So I think this kind of test, experimentation, challenge fund, challenge grants, push on innovation, and trying to learn what are the aspects that work so 
so not that you don't terminate, but between terminate and continuation, you can give a, a reform challenge or even a reform or die challenge. So those are a little opening thoughts to, to get us started. Thank you very much for having me. So we're going to just take a couple questions. Um, Patrick, did you have um, – Patrick McCarthy's here, the president and CEO of the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and you were going to kick it off with a question? Sure. Um, so, Gene, I was really uh, struck by your reference to things that we fund that we have pretty good evidence, actually, that they don't work and in many instances perhaps do harm. Uh, <laughs> and I was interested in your – thoughts about what it takes both uh, politically and from the standpoint of building evidence in order to do away with them. So, for example, you know, we put a lot of money into boot camps right. where kids in juvenile justice actually ended up doing harm. We've got probably 100 years worth of evidence that locking a whole bunch of kids up, 125 or 200 kids in a place does not lead to public safety or to improved outcome for kids, but that's where we're spending millions and millions of dollars, congregate care for kids who don't need to be in congregate care. Again, lots of money crowds out, crowds out the opportunity for innovation. Right. So just curious about your thoughts on how this movement can connect with actually uh, sort of going after the things that don't work that cost like big dollars. Well, no, it's, it, 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 it's a... Uh, um, it's a good question. So first of all, I'll go back to my, my one comment, which is, you know, it, it's worth looking first what the reform potential is. And I think sometimes you say there just is no, it just doesn't work. Now, um, I think obviously, and this is where I think the focus on results and evaluation do better, if you, to go to my issue of, if you seem less like, well, you've just decided to give up on those kids, nothing works. Um, then I think you will get probably on the progressive side more resistance because they'll feel, well, geez, at least we're doing something. Some of those kids are getting through. They're the worst off kids, et cetera. Um, so I think being able to push on the reform. Now, if they just can't fix a program, now I'll give you what we learned when we came in. We were looking at the training programs for disadvantaged youth, and I mean 93 when I came in. And uh, Larry Katz had you know, had done some very innovative research, and he found these programs didn't work. Um, but rather than just say they didn't work at all, he seemed to uncover why they didn't work. Money goes, and then the United States members of Congress want to spread it out so thin that everybody gets a little piece. So the social dynamic was that in poor neighborhoods, there would be five or six slots. And when they went and figured it out, what they realized was, um, you know, I mean, this is good research. They didn't just do the, this work, work. They found out why and basically found out that kids in low-income areas need a critical mass of peers who will do the same things they do. Um, they, uh, you know, if you're one of two or three kids who are going to, like, say, I'm not going to be part of the gang, I'm going to go like work in some program. I'm going to go do this. You're going to be ostracized. You're 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 just not going to do it, or you're going to fade off. But they found at a certain number, it was different. If there were 15 or 20 kids, they not only went to work, they had a friendship, they had social network. So we had to kind of go back to Congress and tell them, look, this just isn't working. We're not going to get rid of this money, but we are going to target, and it's going to be more on the challenge side. And you've got to show that you have a kind of a critical mass and support. That meant less winners, but more effective policies. Now, it was still hard because you were still telling people they weren't going to get as much. I will tell you that part of the reason it might have worked a little better was that you could still give people hope. You know, right now you get $3 million, but guess what? You're going to get to compete to be one of 10, 15 million. So, I mean, I guess one of the, the issues that is worth looking at, since this is an action organization, is not what's just ideal, but, like, how can you overcome that resistance? I think taking money and going more to innovative things at work where people can compete at least allows a senator or a member to go back and say, yeah, that formula is getting cut back. That city's not going to get as much. But, hey, there's this big pool, and we can compete. So it at least gives them hope. And, uh, 
you know, I think sometimes you, you uh, uh, just have to, you know, use the evidence overwhelming, or perhaps you have to build coalitions, split coalitions, get the programs that are working to realize they got to maybe go against a peer. Um, but it's, it, uh, you know, I think it's very difficult. But I do think it happens, and I do think that, uh, I do think evidence matters, and I do think you just, it takes time. And I think the more you build it, the more it helps. You know, I, when, you're, when you leave government, of course, you always feel a little bit like, oh, it's really hard because, you know, I used to be able to just whisper into the president's ear. But you also have the humility of knowing that most stuff that you do in the White House or in Congress, you don't invent that day. It's developed over time in think tanks and policies a bit. So developing the theory that in this area of criminal justice for youth, that doesn't work this does work. And where I think the innovation thing matters, and, and then I'll stop, is that the one thing I have learned over and over again is there is nothing like showing people success. I mean, we went to Mooresville, North Carolina on like our idea of Connect Ed. And I mean, you go into the 100th school district, 100th poor school district of 115, and they've all got laptops, and they're all learning at their desk on computers, and they're the 100th poorest out of 115th, and they're second in results and third in the test scores. I mean, the media comes with you. They want to be cynical. They can't. It's just one example. But you get the innovation of showing things that work you can bring people to it. That depoliticizes it. It's not an Obama or a Boehner thing. It's just a program that works. And then I think that becomes a powerful magnet to moving in that way. One more question. Uh, Shelly Metzenbaum, Volcker Alliance. Hey, how are you? See you, Jean. Um, so you just gave some fabulous examples of using data to both understand problems and their causes and then to sort of inform the actions and, and experiment on an iterative basis on a small scale, which was really interesting. Fabulous examples. So I'm going to ask you to imagine for a moment something that's probably very far from your mind right now, which is a third term working, serving a president in the White House. How can, given the, f you know, the fact that failed trials really are fodder for political attack, yeah. and that um, there are organized constituencies. Can you think of anything a White House could do, especially at the beginning of a new term, that would really increase adoption of this kind of iterative evidence-based practice and using data to actually focus and figure out where you ought to be putting your attention? Well, you know, look, um, you know, I don't want to be as negative as people might think in the past. I I'll give you an example of back in the Clinton administration where it was tough. We, uh, we had a certain goal for how many kids we were going to get in Head Start. And so we fought and fought, and each year we'd get about 500000 So we left. We were spending $2.5 billion more a year. But our numbers of kids were not as strong. And this was disappointing to President Clinton, who had a certain goal. And you had to come in and tell him, you know, Mr. President, Head Start teachers were paid so little, the quality was so bad, we couldn't in good conscience do this. So yes, your achievement is going to be, you're going to be part of increasing the quality more and the teachers more than maybe the numbers. Now that was kind of evidence-based, that was not about eliminating or not funding more, but it was about how you were allocating. I mean, I think the most frustrating thing for maybe progressives a bit was kind of the, the <laughs> when people did the study, well, some early childhood works, but the benefits fade out. Therefore, we shouldn't do the early stuff. I mean, that wanted, made me want to slip my wrist. So hold it. You have, a, you have something that works, so a kid's seven, eight years old, they're like way better off, but it fades away. And your solution is not to figure out what to do at seven or eight so it doesn't get better, but to take away the thing that works. I mean, that's what I mean. That's the double standard. I think that, um, but look, I think that, uh, I, I think things will progress, and I think this idea that there's a bipartisan progression you know, so whether it's Hillary Clinton or Marco Rubio, that there's an ethic being built up that this kind of innovation is good. I also think it's actually, in a way, there is a political advantage for White Houses in the following sense. Um, when you give out kind of just formula money that goes out, 
you spend all this money and someone says, what good did you do? And you kind of can't really tell because it's just going into the general budgets of different things. When you have an innovation program and it works, you can go places, you can visit them, you can see the success. And I think that to me that it really goes back to my kind of FDR quote. I think that if you could get kind of a bipartisan commitment that we as progressives are willing to not just focus on quantity of resources, we're not just going to defend our programs, we're willing to terminate, we're willing to reform, we're willing to be tough on ourselves, and get conservatives to kind of a, a group on certain issues like the college opportunity to say, this is like cancer, this is something we're gonna do, and we're gonna have more trust if you have this process of evaluation. But I guess I would say I'm more you know, the more that I was there this time and the more I'm there, I think that using competitive innovation grants where people can do exciting things, even if you're just as painful as it is taking a chunk of an existing program, excites new thinking, it excites ideas at the White House, and then you're not just saying, oh man, that program doesn't work, kill it. You're saying, we know what does work, let's shift those resources over. And then you're keeping the focus on the kids you're trying to help. And then I think it becomes irresistible because it's not just about are you gonna eliminate that program or not eliminate that program. It's going to be, we know this can save lives and we know this is making it worse. And I think that it becomes very hard. So I do think this kind of constant innovation, a real focus on that, uh, an understanding that those innovation, innovative grants, and then the truth is, you know, from that you might learn what's better, and that will give you more ammunition to go for a full-scale termination and a full-scale because you have better evidence.